Amen. All right, Galatians chapter 5. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5 this morning and next Sunday morning. We're going to do a two-part series on Galatians chapter 5. Now the Galatian church uh, was suffering from some teaching of heresy. Somebody had come into the Galatian church and was teaching works-based salvation, was teaching um, a doctrine of works, and Paul is trying to undo that here. He's trying to um, restructure things and get things back. And Galatians chapter 5 is a great chapter on Christian liberty. Look at verse 13, where the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So Paul is talking about Christian, what we would call Christian liberty here. And since we, of course, believe that, you know, what the Bible teaches is that you're saved through grace and not of works. You know, you are saved, you know, nothing of your own doing, um, not even 1%. It's just completely um, through Jesus Christ, by believing on Jesus Christ is why you are saved. And because of that, and because you're eternally saved, it's an eternal gift, there's nothing that you could ever do, the works that you could do to make yourself unsaved meaning there's nothing you could also do to keep yourself safe. So that means, you know, the inevitable, look, the inevitable result of being justified freely through grace is that you have this Christian liberty, okay? And, you know, you can do whatever you want. That's the bottom line. You know, you'll be out soul winning and you'll have somebody say that to you. Are you telling me I can just go do whatever I want? And I always say, you know, I'm quick to follow it up with an explanation, but I always say, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. You can do whatever you want. You know, whether or not you should is a completely different story. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Look, I mean, you're going to endure chat and I'll follow this up with an explanation you know of Hebrews chapter 12 talking about how you know you will endure chastisement from your Heavenly Father if you just take your Christian liberty and you take advantage of that look at Hebrews 12 and verse number 6 the Bible says for whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth and scourgeth every scourgeth every son whom he receiveth but look you've been adopted into God's family God's going to punish you if you go out and just take advantage of your Christian liberty. But look, you are going to meet people who are endure chastening their entire Christian life. You are just going to find these people. Because I hate to break it to you, you know, sold out, soul winning Christian, but you're in the minority of saved people. I mean, how many saved people do you find out there knocking doors? I mean, they're out there. They exist. We found a couple yesterday. Are they in church? A lot of times they're not. If they're in a church, they're not doing anything. So look, you're going to just find these people that are just going to get beating after beating after beating after beating in their life because they're just going to, they're, they're saved, they've received that gift, and they're just going to go and do whatever they want, and they're going to be a bloody pulp on the ground, and there's nothing that God's going to be able to do to wake them up. You're just going to meet those people, right? So what are we to do, right? Galatians chapter 5, the, one of the, it's one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 5 gives us a methodology. All right, I love, I love that word, by the way. I love methodology. A methodology is, you know, how you do things. Okay, it's a way, it's a specific way of, of, of prosecuting something. All right, if I have a good methodology or I have a bad methodology, it could literally mean the difference between success and failure in just about anything. You know, whether it be fixing a car, whether it be, you know, putting something together, you know, if you have a bad methodology, you're probably going to fail. But Galatians chapter 5 gives us a great methodology on this idea that we see at the end of Galatians chapter 5 called, you know, either, you know, the works of the flesh, Galatians chapter 5 calls it, or the fruits of the spirit. So Galatians chapter 5, it gives us this methodology on how we can recognize where we're at in those two things that are opposing each other. Look at verse 16 of Galatians chapter 5. 
So that's what I want. That's the point of this sermon is to get across to you this methodology that is laid out in Galatians chapter 5. There's a lot in Galatians chapter 5. I don't necessarily want to preach through every single one of these things, you know, as far as the works of the flesh and things like that. But I want to show you enough detail to show you the methodology that God is giving you here so you can, you can be in the right place. You can be where you need to be. All right, look at verse 16. The Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, I mean, this is the answer, right? Close your Bibles. So let's go home, right? Walk in the Spirit. There you go. You got it. But look, we need some more detail like that, right? If I'm going to raise my kids, if I'm going to lead, lead my home, you know, all I would really, you know, it, the answer is walk in the Spirit. Kids, to my wife, walk in the Spirit. To myself, walk in the Spirit. That's all I have to do right? Don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. But look, we'll talk about walking in the Spirit next week. This morning, look at verse 17. The Bible says, for the, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So the Bible says here, and it talks a lot about this in Romans, we study this, you know, we have this flesh. We're saved, but we still have this flesh. We still have this this body, this sinful nature, this flesh that we're going to be dealing with until we die. Yeah. Until we physically die on this earth. We're going to be dealing with this. And the Bible says the spirit is, and the flesh are fighting each other, is what the Bible says. So step one, we're going to talk about, you know, work, the works of the flesh is the point of this sermon this morning. So what are they? How will we know? How will I know if I'm walking in the flesh? If I'm in the flesh or the spirit. Look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Well, there's the first part of the answer right there. That means that the works of the flesh, are they'll, they'll be shown. They will be shown to you. That you're going to notice. It's not going to be something that you just, you can't notice. To be manifest means that they'll be made visible to you. That it's not something that's just going to be invisible. Right? So turn to Ephesians chapter 1. So we have this problem, right? We have this war going on in, in ourselves. I mean, forget about all the problems you have with other people. You have a problem with yourself, right? You have a problem with your spirit, this spirit, and you have a problem with this flesh. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. What's the word of truth? The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, how did, how did we get saved? In whom, I mean, all the answers are in this verse. In whom also that, that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purpose, purchased possession until the praise of his glory. So you are sealed. You are physically sealed if you have believed the gospel. If you believe the gospel, you're physically sealed. But what? You know, you have seals of letters. I, I remember, like, you know, the, how kings used to seal their letters with, like, a wax stamp that was, like, the king's emblem or whatever. They would have, they would melt wax, and they would seal the, the scroll with their, their seal, and it was made of wax. You know, you have a modern envelope that has glue on it. You would lick the glue, and you, you seal the envelope. But the Bible says that you are sealed. It's not glue. It's not wax. It's the literal Holy Spirit that seals you. So it is, look... The point I'm trying to make is, is that He's there. He's there. Who's He? The Holy Spirit. It's a He. He's in you. He's sealing you. Right? He is, and then it says the earnest. That's a down payment. So that the Holy Spirit was given to you as a down payment for your salvation, and He also performs the function of sealing you. Sealing your salvation. So the point is that I have this flesh right here, but I also have this Holy Spirit. They're both present right here, right? They're both together. And verse 14, you know, proves it with, you know, the earnest of your salvation. You know, that's something that, that's used as a noun, that earnest. It's a down payment. It's something of value given to a buyer to, or given by a buyer to a seller to bind a, a deal is what that word means. All right? But the point being is that the Holy Spirit is given as a down payment to bind your salvation. He actually physically seals your salvation. He's there. Okay? So go back to Galatians chapter 5. So now we have this flesh against the Spirit. We need to recognize the works of the flesh. Okay? 
And we should be able to recognize this as the Holy Spirit is able to help us recognize this. Look at verse 19. Because the Bible says they're manifest, which means they're shown, which means you can see them, you can recognize them. Okay, it's not something that will just sneak up on you. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, the works of the flesh, which are these? It says, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Verse 20. Well, let's just focus on verse 19 first. We see this list in verse 19. We'll just go through these three lists, these three verses real quick. So look, in verse 19, we see sins of the carnal category here. Okay, there's plenty of examples in the Bible. Turn to John chapter 8. Um, we see the woman taken in adultery. Of course, adultery, um, very, you know, is common in the Bible. It, it's unfortunate, but these are sins that, you know, we talked about how uh, a couple weeks ago, how it's, it's hard to find certain people in the Bible that did, you know, a lot of things right and all this kind of stuff. But unfortunately, it's pretty easy to find people in the Bible that, that did these carnal sins. Even good, you know, saved men in the Bible, you know, fell into some of these carnal sins in verse number 19. Look at John chapter 8. The Bible says in verse 3, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us. They wanted him to stone her there, but Jesus you know, pardoned her and let her go. Of course, another famous story in the Bible about adultery, and David's got to be in heaven going, man, they're going to bring it up again. But you know, David, David and Bathsheba, you know, the, the biggest adultery story in the Bible. A huge sin here. So look, it's pretty easy to recognize adultery, wouldn't you say? I mean, it's pretty easy to recognize adultery. It's pretty black and white. The next one, fornication. Go to Genesis chapter 34. Fornication, of course, you know, committing carnal sin in that way, you know, outside of marriage, before you're married, right? In Genesis 34, we see the story of uh, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, the Bible says. Jacob's daughter. In Genesis 34, the Bible says this. It says, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when she Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hevite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. So the Bible says that Dinah went out and she went out with the you know, worldly people around her and she went out and she committed fornication with this guy, this prince. Okay? Now, terrible trouble followed. You know, her brothers, of course, you know, were, were a little upset over it and they had killed everybody. So lots of other sins followed after that. Uh, verse 19, but look, this was fornication. This was willing fornication in the Bible. You know, if, if you study this story out, even in verse 19, it says that this guy, it says he was more honorable than all the house of his father. You know, then, of course, Simeon and Levi, you know, they, they go and they have everyone, you know, in the, in the camp circumcised. I mean, it's an interesting story, if nothing else. But it, it's, it's actually terrible when you think about what they did. They went and they killed everybody in the town, right? So look, it's pretty easy to recognize fornication, too. Right, so we have adultery, fornication, but then look what you see um, listed next. You see this um, uncleanness and lasciviousness listed. Okay, now these things, lasciviousness means like lustfulness or, you know, lewdness. All right, that's what lasciviousness needs. But what's interesting about this list, you're going to start to see, you know, the methodology that I'm going to start pointing out to you. But what's interesting about this list in verse 19 is it starts out very obvious with adultery and fornication. I mean, those are pretty straightforward, obvious, in-your-face sins. Would you agree? It le you know, but it, look, it leads into, it lists some more subtle things after that. You know, lewd thoughts, lewd speech. It shows you that, you know, this more subtle action leads to more serious sins, is what it shows you. Look, lasciviousness, lewdness, I mean, don't get me started. Everyone is lewd now. Everyone is lewd now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm frankly sick of it myself. I mean, it just, I mean, we were out like, we were out fishing on Friday, and we're at a fish cleaning station with a couple kids this tall, and there's some older guys there cleaning fish too. And you know what? I would have liked to talk to those older guys. I would have liked to sat there and say, hey, where did you fish? And where did you, you know, what did you catch? And all this kind of stuff. But I'm just sitting there cleaning fish, and I just can't wait to get out of there. Because there's, everyone's lewd now. 
And it doesn't matter because I'm sitting there, i got two little kids here, and these guys are just telling lewd stories. Didn't used to be that way. Even in my life, it didn't used to be that way. I'm not that old. I know you guys think I'm old, but I'm not that old. All right? Look, I I'm sick of it, but look. It it it's becoming common, and it all starts out this way. That is what's going on with this list that God gives you. The main point I'm trying to make is that God, you know, it starts out with these serious physical sins, but look, there's sins that you can recognize first. See? You didn't just, you know, you, you don't just walk down the street, trip and fall, and commit adultery. Like, oops, I committed adultery. No, it starts out with, you know, you're, 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 you're saying things you shouldn't. You're looking at things you shouldn't. You're having thoughts that you shouldn't. God's telling you how to recognize it here. He's trying to keep you from those, those big sins. It starts with those thoughts, that lewdness. And it, look, those serious sins follow. It, it was the same thing with David. It was no different with David. He was looking at something that he shouldn't, look, shouldn't have been looking at, and it ended up leading to adultery and worse. Yeah. Look at verse number 20. We get more works of the flesh. Verse number 20, it lists idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. Look, idolatry, we talked about idolatry of the heart, you know, a couple weeks ago, but mainly idolatry is pretty obvious. I mean, that's not going to, you're not going to accidentally start worshiping something else, right? I mean, that's pretty obvious. Witchcraft, obvious. Heresies, serious, pretty obvious. Especially if you know what's in the Bible, Right? I mean, heresy could be subtle, subtle but not if you, not if you uh, know your Bible, Amen. right? That's why we should know our Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter 37. But then we see some other things, like hatred. Look at Genesis 37. Genesis 37, look at verse number 3. The Bible is talking about Israel and his children, or Jacob and his children. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. You know, first of all, you know, don't ever favor any of your kids. Because it's real. It will lead to actual problems between your kids. It will lead to strife between your children. This isn't what the sermon's about. But don't favor your kids. And if you, you, know, you say one kid, you give one thing to do one thing for one child, you should do it for all the children. Amen. Or it will, it will create that strife. It could turn into hatred, which turns into things that are worse that we'll see. Amen. Variance, strife. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I mean, these are subtle. Variance and strife could be very subtle. Very subtle things that are not obvious to everybody. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 3. The Bible says, For, yet are ye, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saying, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So here they're comparing, you know, Paul against, you know, somebody else. It's like, you know, people that might compare a, one pastor against another pastor and be like, oh, he's better than him for this reason. You just create it. Look, you're creating variance. You're trying to divide people. You're creating strife. Look at emulations. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they are measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. People are comparing themselves to Paul and trying to just create strife in this way, right? And look, wrath, you know, think about Levi and, and Simeon. They went and they, they murdered everybody, including, you know, Sechem, who, you know, defiled their daughter. Seditions, you think about the story of, like, Korah, in number 16, people that just turned against Moses and tried to just create um, sedition that way. So look, there's some sins that are subtle and some that are very obvious. Okay, look at verse 21. 
This is a very good one to compare, to talk about what um, the Bible is trying to show us here. Envyings, murders, whoa, those are pretty murder. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, so I have also told you in time past, that they that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, envying. You think about the Jews. I mean, why did they hate Jesus? They envied him. Right? Murder. What did David's adultery lead, lead to? It, there's plenty of murder stories in the Bible. There's plenty of people that committed murder. These are very obvious things, though. Right? These are very obvious things serious things. I mean, murder is probably the most serious thing that you could think of in the Bible. You're not going to just usually go out and accidentally murder somebody. Right? You're not going to just turn into a murderer. But then look what it says. Drunkenness and revelings at the end. Now, I mean, this is talking about people like partying. Right? I mean, people are just out having some drinks, having a good time. Right? No big deal. No issue. But guess what? You know what, you know what I've noticed? as I've lived in cities throughout the last 20 years, you know when people get shot in Fresno? 2 a.m.? Yeah. That's when the murders happen. At drunken, drunken, you know, revelings, basically. That's when all these things happen. So, you know, what's the point here? You know, we're not, the point of this sermon isn't to really go through every single one of these sins. The point is that God is showing us how we can recognize the beginning stages of serious trouble coming in our life, of the works of the flesh. Galatians, look, Galatians chapter 5, talking about the works of the flesh, is a measuring stick for us. It's, a, it's, a, it's an early warning system. Think of it that way. You know, I used to put control systems in power plants, and we didn't just have uh, an alarm that said, your power plant has exploded. Beep, 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 your power plant is on fire, burning down right now. No, we had early warning systems, right? We had early, you know, if there was a leaky valve or there was something that was just starting to go wrong, we had warning systems all over the place. So you could catch these things up front before the turbine exploded. I mean, that's the whole, I mean, that was the definition of a good or a bad control system. If it could show the operator how to stop something major from happening. That's what Galatians chapter 5 is showing us. I mean, think of it, lasciviousness. It's an early warning sign of fornication and adultery. That's what it is. I mean, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, it leads to heresies. You get somebody who's, who's trying to create variance. I mean, have you seen this before? You get somebody who's trying to create variance and strife in a church. And what do they what do they do? They've been they've been going around creating strife and, and trying to you know compare people against people, and all of a sudden they come up with a new doctrine. Look at me with my new doctrine. It leads to that. I mean, drunkenness and revelings. I mean, do we you don't even have to explain this one? It leads to envyings and, and murder. So Looking at these early warning signs can stop the greater sins from manifesting in your flesh. That's, that's the methodology. So look, think about your thoughts. First of all, step one, your thoughts. Why am I having these thoughts? There's your early warning system right there. Maybe I should not be doing, you know, if, if I'm having thoughts, you know, no one's getting hurt by thoughts at this moment, right, if you're having bad thoughts. But why am I having thoughts? What am, I, what am I looking at? What am I doing in my life that's creating these types of thoughts? Maybe you should catch yourself there. There's your early warning system. You know, to, to these even minor actions like, like drinking. Like drinking was like a, like a culture of the Midwest where I grew up. It was normal. Look, if you did drugs, you were a loser in the culture that I grew up in. The small towns and all this kind of stuff. But drinking was normal. Drinking was, was, was normal. It was, it was harmless, right? But look, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it leads to this kind of stuff like murder, drunkenness, revelings. Look, it's very simple. I mean, the, the problem with drinking is, is, is so simple. Just don't ever go there at all. I mean, it's, the, it's one of the easiest things in your life to solve. Just don't ever go there at all because it leads to more serious sins. And the Bible will tell you that over and over. A murder, adultery, fornication. It leads to all that. I mean, I wonder, 
I wondered when writing this sermon how many people were in prison today because of drunkenness. And I went and I looked it up, and you know what it is? You know, all the violent offenders in prison right now, 40% of them committed their offense when they were drinking or drunk. 40%. That's almost half. I mean, so, you know, when you look, when you go to, when you go to CVS Pharmacy, I mean, they're there to either heal you or kill you, depending on what aisle you look at. I even said that to the cashier one time. They didn't think it was funny. <laughs> I'm like, why? Well, you kill me and heal me. They're like, what? <laughs> We're at the fish cleaning station. This has nothing to do with the sermon. We're at the fish cleaning sta station on Friday, and I'm just getting done cleaning this fish, and I had like this fish carcass, guts everywhere. And this lady comes up, and she says, she goes, she goes, can I have your fish head? I mean, she like wanted to bury it in her garden or something. She asked the guy across from me, and he's like, oh, I already threw all my fish guts away. You can climb in the dumpster and get it, though. And she's like, oh, no, no. She comes over to me, she's like, can I have your fish head? And I said, well, I gotta call my wife and see if she wants it first. And she's like, oh, okay. And I'm like, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm like, here you go. And I'm like, guts hanging everywhere. She's like, thank you. I told uh, Brother Ryan, I'm like, she's from San Francisco for sure. <laughs> All right, anyway, back to the sermon. So look, alcohol. We think alcohol is, is, is harmless today because it's so common. It's like, it's like a vain repetition, right? It loses, it loses its meaning because it's so common. But the Bible tells us that it, like, if it leads to murder, you're not wise. Right? I mean, look, it, it, it's, it's apparently 800,000 people in prison right now don't think it's a, a no big deal. Yeah, yeah. Right? You say, well, most people that drink don't go and, and, and commit violence. Well, 800,000 people do. 800,000 people. For, and for eight, every 800,000 of those people, there's multiple victims. Think of that. Think of all the people that were killed or assaulted or, or, or run over or whatever. Right? Lives ruined. Family, I mean, families destroyed. It's, it's, a, it's a small sin, maybe, to some people that leads to these huge things. Huge problems. I was just reading a story of, of, an, of an army platoon. And they got into some trouble when they were in, in Afghanistan or wherever. And I think they accidentally killed some people, murdered some people or whatever. And they came back to the United States. And it's this just pressing story about this army platoon. And they, just, they were just just drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking and like half of them have killed themselves. They call it the cursed platoon. Because it's just, it's just leading to all this, just this evil and violence and, and they're just killing themselves. So it, it's, not, it's not no big deal. Just because it's common, just because it's a vain repetition today, it's not no big deal. Just because lewdness is a normal thing today. Look, this world, every single day of my life that goes by this world is wicked as literal hell. Right. I mean, we are trying to figure out how to follow the Bible as, as, as these flesh-bearing creatures in this world. And this world is just constantly attacking. Constantly attacking. It is wicked as hell. And we have to stay away from this lewdness, from this internet garbage that is constantly knocking at everybody's door because it will lead to destroyed lives. It'll lead to fornication. It'll lead to adultery. It'll lead to destroyed families. It's a methodology that God is giving us here. He is showing us, here's some things. You see these things, you're in the works of the flesh. Use the spirit that's in you to recognize the beginning, the early warning signs, and, and look, that's what God is giving you in Galatians chapter 5. He's given you this. So you can catch it before it gets, it gets serious. It's, it's easier to, look, it's better to fix a leaky valve than a destroyed power plant. Turn to James chapter 1. <clears throat> and another funny thing 
about the works of the flesh, and especially these early warning works of the flesh, is that many times, and this is the importance of, of being in church and being plugged in and being around uh, you know, the fellowship of the believers. Because many times you will either not recognize it yourself or you, you just will not want to recognize it yourself. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. The Bible says, look in verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So here it's talking about, look, if you're looking into the perfect law of liberty, look, you're Christian liberty. That's your perfect law. You have Christian liberty. But if you're, you're in the Bible, you're reading the Bible, it's like these things, these things are going to be obvious to you. When you are reading the Bible and you're in the, it's a snowball effect in both directions. If you're in the Bible, you're in church, you're in the fellowship of the believers, and these things start coming into your life, you're going to recognize them like that. But when you start getting out of church and you start getting out of fellowship and you stop reading the Bible, you stop looking in that mirror, you're not going to see these things. And guess what? Other people will see those things. But if you're not hanging around those people, what good is that going to do? So look, if you ever feel yourself like, yeah, you know, I don't really feel like going to church anymore. I don't really feel like, you know, going out and hanging out with, you know, my Christian brothers and sisters anymore. There's a warning sign right there for yourself personally. Because they're going to see things and you don't want to hang out with them because you know that they're going to see things. They're going to notice things. So this, this is your mirror right here. This is your mirror. You need, look, you need to be looking in it. You need to be looking in it. That's why Galatians 5 is so important for us. So we can see these things. We can see these minor early warning signs. I mean, think about, think about the men in the Bible. Think about David, one of the greatest men in the Bible. And think about when he fell on his face the hardest. It was the, it was the, the carnal sins took him straight down. And he paid a heavy, look, he paid for it. He paid a heavy price for it, but there was early warning signs. So you don't think, you know, hey, it's not going to happen to me. It happened to David. He had a perfect heart towards the Lord. I mean, a man after God's own heart. Are you after God's heart? Do you think that every day in my life I'm just after God's heart? Because David was, and it happened to him. So we need to be aware of these works of the flesh. We need to watch for these things. We need to be in fellowship with each other. And if we're not, and we suddenly don't want to do those things, because look, when, when, when you're in the works of the flesh, you're not going to want, you're going to be grieving that Holy Spirit, and you know, you're not going to want to go into those things of the Spirit. So you need to watch those desires in your life. That's the biggest thing right there. What, what do I want to do? What are my desires right now? And if you, you can't wait to go to church on Sunday morning, you can't wait to go to the church picnic, you can't wait to go out soul winning, you're, you're, you're probably doing pretty well. We're going to talk about that next Sunday morning. But look, if all those things start to lose their appeal to you, then these other things are, are, are soon to follow, if not already there. So Galatians 5 is giving us a methodology on how to stay away from the works of the flesh and to be in walking in that spirit. We're going to talk about the other side of that coin on next Sunday morning. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.